definitely like executives in general, investors, they're all looking for like, they all want there to be a silver bullet. They're, they all want there to be this like killer strategy that, you know, slingshots them ahead of the competition. And my honest answer is that that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. It and, and the only times that it does exist, it's more so catching the right market dynamics and wave mm -hmm. and you just catch it at the right time. It's like literally thinking of it as surfing, you know, mm -hmm. you can, the wave is there. Some people catch it, some people don't, and you can get pushed really like everything can go well or it cannot. All right. Welcome to today's episode of the Vital podcast. This is Vital co-founder Ian Naj. And today we have a very special guest, Mr. Eli Rubel. E Eli is the CEO and founder of Mattermade, which is a pretty much the biggest, most successful B2B agency in Silicon Valley. Eli and his team have helped companies like Dropbox, Loom, Hopin, G2, Calm, Product Board, and many more smash their yearly growth targets through best in class, go to market and demand generation programs. And Eli's incredibly smart guy and has developed some very interesting techniques, strategies that not only apply to big, well-funded B2B enterprises, but all the way down to real hardcore, scrappy D2C startups. So I think you're going to love what he's going to share with us today and uh, can't wait to share everything that Eli's going to talk about. So without further ado, let's get into the podcast. This podcast is brought to you by VidTao.com. VidTao is our free YouTube ad library and spy tool, research tool. It's V-I-D-T-A-O.com. At VidTao, we have close to a million ads, YouTube ads, unlisted YouTube video ads listed that you can search, find, discover how they're doing on a day-by-day -day basis so you can really see what ads your competitors are running, see ads in different markets that you can model to create new winning ads for yourself and a whole lot more. It's all there inside vidtau.com. Plus we have a premium edition. So the database is free to access, but then we also have a premium edition where you have full unlimited access to the database. And inside there, we also provide training. So we also run an agency called Inceptly. That's I-N-C-E-P-T-L-Y inceptly.com where we've managed over 150 million dollars on youtube it's a video traffic agency and we've worked with everyone from brands like descript.com huel to real scrappy direct response info products supplements health beauty e-commerce you name it we've done it and love sharing what we've learned every week we drop new training in there everything from youtube ad media buying to running e-commerce creatives on YouTube to hardcore tracking and attribution tutorials to really level up your data science game for advertising and everything in between. Right now, as we speak, we're working on a training regarding YouTube shorts. Um, hopefully we'll be live by the time you hear this. On and on and on. This is our passion is video advertising and we wanna share it with you inside of Vital Premium. And actually right now, for a limited time, you can get access to VidTau Premium for a very special price. So if you go to VidTau.com, sign up for free, check out the database, upgrade to premium for this very special price, you'll get access to all of the database and all the trainings. And also wanted to add that at Inceptly, we do free brainstorm calls with clients like you. So if you ever wanna get help or ask questions about your YouTube ads, your video traffic on other platforms are available to chat. Just go to inceptly.com slash call, C-A-L-L, -L, and set up a time to chat. It's free and we'd love to speak with you. Our team's waiting to speak with you. So without further ado, let's get into the show. Hello. Hey, hey. Eli. How's it going, man? Good. What a cool, what a cool room. Is that real or is that a background? It's uh, this is my attic. That's a, that's a great attic. Thanks, man. Nice. Yeah, oh, what you... Colorado. Yeah. Yeah. In Denver. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. How's your week been? Good. You know, a little hectic, but um, can't complain. Can't complain. Right on. Thanks again for that. 
Thanks again for that intro to uh, Nathan. Cool. Did you get to yeah. connect? Yeah, we connected. I'm going to go on his podcast. Nice. Oh, that's so, going to be fun. Yeah. He's going to ask you some. He's going to ask you some 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 real straight shooter questions. Singers. <laughs> Did you? Were you on there? No, I haven't been on there, but I I've, I've listened to a few. He, uh, he even in his Slack conversations. He's, what was your revenue for the event? How many refunds did you have? <laughs> Super direct, just like extracting the extracting the uh, the numbers. So should should be interesting. Oh man, he's talking yeah. to the wrong guy. I'm, I'm gonna have to bring one of my team members on to answer his <laughs> questions. Shit. No, 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 I'm sure. It, dude, whatever, whatever happens, it'll be interesting. Um, I, I think, especially in that community, uh, yeah, it would be amazing. There's there's so many people ripe for. Uh, what it is that you built your career on really. So, I mean, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. That's going to be fun. Very yeah. Cool. Well, yeah. I appreciate that. Awesome. Um, yeah. Well, do you want to just dive right in and we'll kind of just, I mean, I'm just going to ask you some questions and just we'll chat, talk about your background and, and things like that. And, you know, this is more of a, I would say like a D to C, B to C type of audience where we have no idea what it is that folks like you do to scale these ridiculously successful companies. Um, and so it's just all a, a new world. <laughs> so, yeah, for sure. I mean, do you, do you want to give me like a little bit of a pre-brief on just generally the direction you want to take it or yeah, what you think they'd be most interested in? Yeah. So, I mean, so basically I, I have a few questions. Um, so, Basically, I wanted to talk about, first of all, congrats on the website. Um, looks looks beautiful. I know you talked about you, you're in the process of wrapping that up. Um, so I just want to talk about your background, coming from a design background, um, talking about just the process, your journey, really. Um, you know, I, I maybe I didn't find anything, but I, I didn't hear much about when I was looking at some of your past interviews and stuff, um, you talking about just how you got to Eli and photo school. Eli first, you know, first SaaS raising, exiting, starts the agency. Just kind of walk through that journey. Is super, it's going to be super interesting to everybody. Um, and then also cool. just about how the how the traditional agency model has, in many cases, failed in the sort of the space that you've been operating in, um, and you know why you've so quickly become the the, the go to agency for making things happen. Um, and just some tactical stuff, you know, talking about your triage process, because you have so many different tools you, you can put into the mix when someone comes on board with you, um, and tying that into demand efficiency, you know, just getting more understanding that. And let's see. Um, yeah, I mean, just talking about kind of your unique positioning, it seems like being sort of a, like a bolt on insanely world-class marketing engine for these companies who otherwise would have to do have amazing HR to be able to find ama amazing marketing people and you have, how you accelerate yeah. that process. Um, and just honestly, just chatting. There's no like, um, and in the end also just, you talked about your design business that you're, that you're launching. Just, if you want to talk about that, I think this, you have 65,000 people here and um, design as a, uh, a conversion enhancer like a like a performance enhancer um, is something that d to c people are starting to really recognize and so yeah i mean those are kind of the finger painting touch points that i had in mind oh yeah love it uh sounds like fun cool. how's is my audio coming in really sounds perfect to me sounds perfect awesome. to me. yeah camera looks good audio looks good um depending on how the recording comes out we may we may just do the audio um, it, it really depends on a few things, but we sure. got the video, so it should be good to rock. Let's do it. I've got All right. water. Awesome. All right, cool. Well, today we got a very special guest, Mr. Eli. Is it Rubel? Is that how you say your last name? No. I was totally. joking on my water. One sec. Let's go. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Already blowing it. No. I'm sorry. Oh, not your fault. Woo. <clears throat> there we go. Now I'm it's ready. Back. Back. All right. <laughs> I'm back. I'm back. Airways Ooh. clear. Nice. Didn't need to do CPR. 
All right, cool. Let's, we just we just started. Eli, welcome to the show. Awesome to have you here. And yeah, Ian, yeah. stoked to be here. Thanks for having yeah. me. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I got to say congrats on your new website. So mattermade.co. And uh, last time we spoke, you, I was so impressed. I said, hey, I love your website. I love the design. And you said, well, actually, we're actually re redesigning it. So <laughs> it looks even better. So amazing work on that. Um, that's fantastic. Hell, hell yeah. Everyone should go there. I, and check yeah, it out. I'm glad. I'm glad you like it. Yeah, it's uh, that was a every time we get to work on our own brand, it's always like near and dear to my heart. And we have such a talented creative team. Um, so birthing out this new kind of matter made V2 website into the wild was, was a blast. Yeah. I mean, that's something that really comes across in, in all of your marketing materials, your sort of white papers, everything else. And, um, it, so it's interesting because you actually have a really strong design background, like a formal design background. So how did you, how did you end up there in the first place? Were you like a, an art, an art kid, like a photo kid? I know you went to, yeah. 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 No, I definitely was. I was the, uh, like in, in, I mean, even as early as middle school, I was, I had a camera around my neck all the time shooting like, um, black and white and color negs. And, um, I was kind of the awkward, like, I wouldn't say I was like a the, the loner type of persona, but I was very much like the art kid persona where I was, I was paving my own path uh, <laughs> and, uh, and was very interested in spending as much time in the dark room as possible. And pretty early on in high school I was like, all right, I, I don't really need to be here. Like I need to go off and do, go to photo school. Like that's what I'm, I know what I'm going to do with my life. Why am I wasting my time in high school? So almost, almost didn't graduate high school. <laughs> Uh, managed to convince the principal to give me some some credits for uh, for doing a bunch of photo stuff, um, but yeah, long story short, I ended up going off to photo school to art school. Um, dropped out about halfway through, moved down to LA to be a full time photographer. Um, did the kind of starving artist thing in LA, which was a blast. I some some of the most fun I've ever had in my career. Also, some of the most challenging. You know, I was waiting tables to pay the bills and exhibiting as a, a gallerist and um, photographer uh, outside of the time that I was waiting tables. And so that's, that was really my passion, but I pretty quickly came to this realization of, you know, I don't want to be eating ramen my entire life. And I, mm -hmm. I'd have aspirations of a certain lifestyle, but I also didn't want to sell out the, my art, right? Like I didn't want to take my career in a direction that I didn't want to go with it art wise at the expense of paying bills. And so I remember, I don't know who recommended the book to me, but at some point, actually I do, I remember who recommended it. Anyway, somebody wrote, one of my good friends recommended this book to me, the four hour work week, which everyone's heard of at this point. And it, it, it triggered what I call my quarter life crisis where I was like, well, shit, I need to do something about this, or I'm going to be in LA waiting tables, having the time of my life, working on my art in the background uh, forever. And so I, I moved into my mom's basement, left LA and told myself I couldn't leave my mom's basement until I had started a company. And that was the, the very, very beginnings of it all. Wow. You went to the basement. And so what were your, what were your inputs in the basement? Like, what did you have as your material in there to inspire you to work with? And yeah. How did that go? <laughs> I mean, on a literal level, it was an unfinished basement. So, <laughs> so the uh, concrete floor, it would flood in the winter when, when it would rain. I would have like an inch of standing water in the basement. Uh, <laughs> typical typical Portland, Oregon weather uh, and basement situation. So yeah, my, I mean, my motivation was extremely high to get the hell out of there. I was also very grateful in the first place that I could fall back on that and, mm -hmm. and have that space. But uh, um, yeah, I mean, my inputs were like, I was reading TechCrunch every day. I was reading, you know, books on entrepreneurship every day. I didn't have obviously a background in business. Um, and so all I knew was I was young enough at that point that I could figure out air quotes for anyone who's just listening, not watching. I could figure out the internet <laughs> and start an air quotes internet business. Um, and my kind of hypothesis was it would be easier for me to do this if I picked something really, really boring that no one else wanted to work on. Hmm. but it was still a real business problem. And so I kind of skirted through a, a variety of different ideas, made some progress on some of them, 
And in the meantime, I was networking my way around different business leaders in Portland, kind of asking them, Hey, how did you get to where you are today? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, what was your path like? What do you recommend? And at one point in time, I got a call from the only seed fund at the time in town. And they said, Hey, you don't know us, but we know us of you, you've managed to network with most of our local LPs unknowingly, <laughs> and we want you to come talk to us about your idea. And so they, they essentially sat me down. They're like, we think your current idea is dumb, but we really like your tenacity and just kind of how you're approaching this whole thing. So how about we cut you a check for 50 grand and you're willing to work on what the idea is with us. Like you're open to changing your idea. I was like, hell yes. Like hmm. no one else is handing me money. I'm, you know, I'd opened up probably two, maybe three credit cards at that point to like float myself while I, you know, I was, I was investing in myself, but in a really sketchy way. <laughs> <laughs> and so this $50,000 check was like, you know, flew out of the blue and was amazing. And in the process of going through closing that round of financing, a very simple round of financing, this was before the advent of uh, safe note or any kind of like truly standardized docs we were going back and forth and redlining things. And I started to become obsessed with the inefficiencies in, in the communication and process between myself, my counsel, my counsel and their counsel and them and their counsel. It was just mm -hmm. like, this should be very streamlined and somehow it's pretty confusing. And so I started interviewing lawyers. It's like, Hey, tell me about, you know, your workflow with clients. And again, could go drone on about this forever, but the long story short is I ended up um, pivoting to a contract lifecycle management platform was going to be the, the, that was the SaaS platform that I was building, uh, much akin to what essentially PandaDoc is today. Mm -hmm. So, uh, which is funny because I remember when I was first starting Glider, Glider.com uh, doesn't exist at that domain anymore. But um, when we were first building it, PandaDoc was like at the same stage as us. So it's, really? it's funny to see the industry grow up and see where people take things. Yeah. And then that business was ultimately acquired in 2014. Wow, that's crazy. So it that whole idea emerged from a genuine frustration that you experienced. It wasn't like yeah. you, yeah, that's crazy. Did you so how how deep did you get on the previous the previous boring idea? Did you how like <laughs> did you have a like an MVP or anything? Um well, so the I would say the boring idea was the contract management platform okay. I built, right? Okay. Like that okay. one was like, man, who wants to sell to lawyers? Or in this case, like we ended yeah. up selling to sales teams and yeah. CFOs and you're talking about contracts, like here's this art kid selling contract software to lawyers <laughs> and sales people and CFOs. Like, wow, boring yeah. is all hell. Uh, so that one was the boring foot in the door business. The one before it that I think you're asking about is like, what was the one that we pivoted away from that they said was a dumb idea, mm -hmm. uh, which was closer to my roots. So this was back before Instagram. And I, as a, as a photographer, I was like, man, you know what I hate is that I get on Facebook because everybody's still hanging out on Facebook then. And all of our friends, you know, they go on a trip and they, they dump like 150 photos. They just dump the whole card onto, into, into Facebook. And it's like unedited mm -hmm. garbage. And you have to, you know, this is when we actually still cared to look through our friends' photos on Facebook. <laughs> yeah. and like, God, I just, I just kind of want to see like a curation of the trip. Yeah. Um, and so the first company, the first idea, the first company was called tell it in 10. And the idea was that you would curate a story in 10 photos. And um, we, we built this piece of technology that would scrape the metadata comments, um, all of these different things across all of your Facebook photographs, um, and then let you search using rich text. So mm -hmm. it's kind of funny, fast, fast forwarding because like Instagram stories is essentially the same concept. Mm -hmm. And even, and well before Instagram stories came around, Facebook released something called graph search, which allowed you to use rich text to say like, oh, show me photos of my buddy Ian and I in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And it would like poof, surface that. Um, so right idea, wrong time, but it was, it was fun. We built it, it worked. Uh, and then I pivoted to the contract thing. That's crazy. And so, I mean, obviously you didn't have that hardcore tech background. So how'd you go about having the idea and then actually building it? Dude, honestly, I, I think back on this sometimes and I don't, I don't know how it happened. Like I do know how it happened. I, I convinced some really awesome people to jam on the project with me and uh, got them bought on in on the vision and excited. And they were technical and didn't have 
the same business kind of uh, entrepreneurship drive, but they had the technical drive. And so they saw how I would be a compliment to them and they would mm-hmm. be a compliment to me. But at the same time, I'm, I'm trying to imagine like the much more logical adult mind that I have now as compared to then. And I'm like, man, how the, they shouldn't have said yes to me. Like <laughs> I'm sure some of, I'm sure a few of the folks who worked with me back then are glad they did. And, and uh, on all sorts of different fronts, it was a good, good thing to get involved, but I'm just trying to imagine like pitching someone now, if I was back then, like hadn't had that success yet, they really went on a limb to work, mm-hmm. to work with me and a partner. I, uh, so I'm really grateful and a little, little bit confused still. Why they said yes. Well, I think it's, I think it's really interesting that, you know, you go back to, you know, home base and you kind of reset in the basement, but you're not just reading books. You're not just, you're doing all that stuff, which is super important, but you're, you just said it, you went out and networked, you asked, you're interviewing people throughout the community there that you had access to, to the point where every person who was, you know, an entrepreneur in a related space to you was aware of you and had met you. That's a, that's a really interesting instinct because I don't think a lot of people have that instinct. Um, and it seems like, you know, just fast forwarding to now, like that's how much of that impulse to connect and explore like face to face has driven what you've ended up doing at matter made your agency. Yeah. I mean, I definitely think that that strategy, whether I saw it as a strategy or just something that was like innate, um, has always been the backbone of my success. Like I've never been, I've never been the expert in the room at X or like now I've kind of become that, but for the longest time I wasn't. And I just had to find people who are smarter than me and find a way to incentivize them to be on my team or be part of my world and find a way to add value to their world. And that was how I always got things done. Right. And it wasn't until I stayed in one space long enough where I was like, oh shit, I guess I kind of do have a decent voice in this room. Um, but my, my operating, my MO was always like, find the smarter people, bring them in, add value to them. And then I get to draft off of, you know, their smarts basically. Um, yeah. That's, that's super cool. It's, it's just so, so smart versus trying to be like the hero, you know, which is, it's a, it's a, a common trap, shall we say. Um, that's that's super cool and so okay so you you did glider you you know you got funding for glider you got that 50k and so what was your step from there how did you go about getting customers for glider and making it such a success yeah i mean so we we took that first 50k and then i (laughs) banged my head against the wall in portland trying to raise more money couldn't raise more money and then i i said to my co-founders it's like look i'm gonna fly to san francisco I'm not going to leave until, and I'd been trying to raise money in Portland for like three months at this point, four months. It's like, I'm not going to leave San Francisco until I've raised this round. So you'll see me in a few months and and that'll be that. I flew back to Portland uh, three days later. I'd oversubscribed our first venture round. Uh, um, We had awesome VCs like True Ventures and a handful of others. And yeah, so that was, so that put enough money in the bank for us to actually start building a real company. Um, and then, I mean, the finding the first customers, it was a lot of the same. It's mm-hmm. a lot of the same stuff that I still do to, today. It's like, who are the people who, who are influential in your space or buyers in your space? And how can you add value to their world and spend high quality time with them? Not, not really talking about what it is that you do, but mm-hmm. just building relationships. And inherently, if you're creating something of value, they're going to see that and learn about it eventually. And then they're going to come to you wanting to buy. Right. And so it's a, it's a bit of a softer, longer sale, but that's always been my approach is like, you have something of real value, then all you need to do is build trust and have eyeballs. And then they're going to put two and two together and say, Hey, like, tell me more about this thing. Mm. Wow. So that, and that continues, that continued to be your approach to transitioning from getting funding to getting those key customers. And and then, yeah. and then, so basically what was the pathway to exit on that? Yeah. So that, I mean, that business we sold really early. Like we, we were in the process of closing our uh, next round of financing and a 30 year veteran in our space called FPX. um, They had this very old 
antiquated piece of technology that they were looking to refresh. Um, mm -hmm. They had an amazing book of business. They've been around forever, but they, they needed to update certain pieces of their tech. And so they came knocking at the same time I was raising that round and basically were like, here, let's give you an offer that you can't refuse. Let's make this make sense for you. Um, and so I went back to our investors and I was like, Hey, I know we're raising this round. Um, and it'd been honestly, it'd been hard to raise that round. Like it was crazy times. And, um, so this made a whole ton of sense for us to take. And we got an LOI from them, went through maybe two or three months worth of diligence and all the craziness that's, that is going through an acquisition. And then they bought us. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, that was the, that was the process for that one. And then after that, I, I worked for them for probably about a year mm -hmm. and then was like, man, I am so burnt out on tech right now. I just need to take a break, mm -hmm. traveled around the world a bit on a motorcycle. And then, uh, that's when I bought the e-commerce business as like a, Hey, I need to take a break from tech. Let's do something that's still one foot in the door adjacent, but totally different. Learn something new. Um, yeah. So, okay. So I know there's a kind of a little, uh, anecdote here where you went, you exited and then soon you're, you're eating ramen again. <laughs> what, what was, what was that all about? Uh, do you mean like you, on the I, motorcycle trip? I, I, yeah. Yeah. Like, so was there sort of a, there, was there sort of like on the motorcycle trip where you, you were just, you were like roughing it kind of like back, back to the oh, yeah. space. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 I mean, that's what, that's my favorite way to do things. So like, yeah, yeah, yeah. we had, I had just exited, which for me was like a, a life-changing event. Yeah. And the, yeah, the first thing I wanted to do was like go backpacking basically, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, um, stay in hostels. It was not, I, I would think I was also still young enough that like, I didn't immediately shift to like, oh, I want to go, you know, stay at the four seasons for a year <laughs> yeah, in ball yeah. in bali or whatever like right, right. not that that has to do with age but um yeah no i just was like okay i'm gonna buy the motorcycle i've always wanted yeah. and i'm gonna ride it from portland oregon to panama yeah um, oh damn yeah yeah how did you get around the what is it called the the darien gap yeah what the darien gap yeah. well so we stopped in panama okay we didn't we didn't cross into colombia i flew to colombia and, and did a bit of backpacking there but um yeah so we we stopped before the daring gap right at the uh, but you, you can't Panama. you can't cross the daring gap like on you have to it's a isn't it like a crazy it's been done trail? it's it has, there's some okay. crazy photos of like okay. people in the 70s and 80s on these weird looking motorcycles where they're balancing them on a wood beam that's a you know foot wide with local people helping them across i mean it's nuts but yeah you would no, no normal person would <laughs> cross the daring dude gap. i'm still i'm still super impressed that's insane from portland all the way down that's wild um that's crazy um so you, okay so you're you, you're on your trip for about a year you said uh yeah. traveling around and then and you got the itch so you started looking for e-commerce stores to buy or did you just think about buying a business and then the e-commerce store kind of appeared what was that what was that like i did i didn't even know that i was looking to buy a business i was just i was just kind of like floating and trying mm -hmm. to figure out what was next it was honestly not like the most i think if you talk to anybody who's sold their company before it's not a com it's not always not necessarily a comfortable process afterwards right like you kind of go back to the drawing board a lot of your identity is like wiped away you're trying to figure out who you are what to do next and like those are the it, you end up facing a lot of like existential questions that you didn't necessarily want to have to like <laughs> think about <laughs> um and obviously like there's pros and cons that you that you're like you, you're receiving a lot of goodness but you're also kind of going back to the drawing board with your identity sometimes, or at least that's what happened to me. So I was like sitting in coffee shops going like, fuck, what do I do with my life? What do I do with my life? <laughs> um, and you know, that everybody talks about like, Oh, if you make your passion, your work, then you'll never work a day in your life, which <laughs> right. I tried. Uh, <laughs> and it turned out not to be true, but or for me at least, uh, <laughs> yeah. but so yeah, the motorcycle shop was like, or so the e-commerce shop, I was like talking to my friends, like I want to do something that's related to my hobbies, my passion, and a buddy of mine was like, Hey, one of my friends is like this brick and mortar motorcycle guy. Mm -hmm. He owns all these brick and mortar motorcycle shops. And one of the shops he bought has this big, it's like the largest e-commerce shop of its type in the motorcycle space. He doesn't know how to turn a computer on. He's very much like old school. Maybe you could buy it from him. So I bought, I met with him 
had a cup of coffee, ended up buying this e-commerce property from him um, and doing like a four-year turnaround. And then we sold it to private equity in 2019. Wow. Um, but yeah, that was, that was my attempt. I was like, man, I'll just spend all my time thinking about motorcycles and like talking to motorcycle enthusiasts and just like demoing all the coolest stuff. And it turned out like I rode, I didn't ride at all during that time. Right. When, when I was riding, it was like, I was, it felt like I was at work, you know, uh, uh, so, yeah. but it was a great, it was a fun journey. It was a fun experience. So what, what did you on the marketing side, what did you learn? And that, that was a four year process. You said, so yeah, bu- buying it where it's kind of just collecting dust, a lot of potential and you turn it around and sell it to private equity in four years. What, yeah. what did you, there must've been some amazing learnings you had during that time. Yeah. I mean, I think my my biggest takeaways from that whole period of time were mostly around like market dynamics and paying real close attention to what's happening on a broader market level. Um, We, you know, I bought that business. Amazon obviously was already very big at that point and like part of our daily lives, but they hadn't yet fully moved into like, you couldn't go buy parts for your motorcycle on Amazon quite yet. It was, but it was starting to happen. It was like, they were trying to crack that code. They were starting to let people onto the platform and make it easier for them to, you know, put in their year, make and model and that sort of thing. And so by the time I was exiting that business, it was like someone was standing next to me with a bullhorn in my ear going, Hey, you, this business has, Mm -hmm. does not have a future because of the way everything's going. Like this just get out basically. Um, and so that, I mean, it, which intellectually was really interesting. Right. And then you're competing, so you're competing against Amazon and the expectations that it sets on the consumer mindset around shipping speed and customer service and all these like great things that Amazon has done, but makes it really hard as an indie shop, uh, to compete. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, and then with the parts coming into the platform on Amazon, plus there was like rolling up happening of smaller e-com shops in that space. So it was, it was very much like aggregating into a few big players who are all just throwing tons of money to compete on like free overnight shipping and these sorts mm-hmm. of things, which as you know, we had a 4,000 square foot warehouse. We weren't about to, you know, just to give a sense of scale, it wasn't huge. Right. Um, I think we had like 22,000 SKUs under management. Um, and that was the other thing, like just stuff you wouldn't normally think through, uh, if you're building, let's say you're you're like Viore or something like that, like a cool clothing company. Mm-hmm. Okay, maybe you have in the early days, maybe you have like 20 to 50 SKUs and each of those SKUs comes in five sizes, mm-hmm. right? So like that's that feels pretty manageable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and then maybe that, and, and you're probably controlling the sourcing and all that stuff. So uh, whereas we had 22,000 SKUs, and they had to map to like year make model, which had like all of those variants. And then maybe we had 300 or so um, different vendors we got these things from. So wow. just managing that all plus the market dynamics. I think that was my biggest takeaway. It was like, before you step into something, mm-hmm. don't just look at, you know, I looked at that business and the way I evaluate it was like, it's something I care about and passionate about. The business is doing poorly so I can buy it you know, in a, in a leveraged way. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm highly confident I can 10 to 20 X what the business Mm -hmm. is doing. Mm -hmm. And it's like, all of those things remained true throughout. And I did that. I did that thing, but it doesn't, that doesn't impact or change the broader macro dynamics of Mm -hmm. a business. And so my biggest takeaway that I carry forward now is like, and it sounds so obvious and dumb that I didn't do this at the time, but just like, don't, don't ignore macro market trends. Mm -hmm. It makes a lot of sense. So 2019, you sell, sold the motorcycle e-commerce business. Mm-hmm. And then, I mean, very quickly, you were, you were, you were matter made. You're, you're <laughs> doing sort of like, for like Dropbox, for Loom. Like how the hell does that happen? Like what, yeah. what, what was that process like? So first of all, you sold it. Did you go on another motorcycle trip? No, no. The timing of the sale was like, Right before COVID was happening, my wife and I had just left San Francisco, we're moving to Denver, relocating. So it was it was at a very like stressful and and intense period of time with like the move plus COVID plus everything. Um, 
And yeah, so there's no like awesome adventure to be had this time around. <laughs> uh, we were, we were, we had found an Airbnb that looked really cute next to a park above someone's garage. And we were going to be there for like a week while we, you know, found a better Airbnb. And then we ended up getting locked down in that apartment above their garage. <laughs> uh, so, you know, just everybody's got their fun first, first couple of months of quarantine story. That's mine. Um, but thankfully the transaction closed before that whole, before COVID really became a thing. Cause I think that would have tanked the, tanked the deal. Um, but to your question on matter made, yeah, I mean, the spirit of matter made had always been going on. Like ever since I sold that first company, mm -hmm. my investors and other people would come and say, Hey, like, can you do, can you help at like an interim CMO level, spend a couple hours with this portfolio company help them think about how to avoid common fit pitfalls and, you know, accelerate their time to results. And so I'd been doing that even when I was running the e-commerce business and mm -hmm. just like doing it on the side for fun, again, to keep one foot in the water of mm -hmm. the venture world and, and the startup world. Um, what I found though, through that time, through those years of doing that was the, the strategy was only so helpful if the teams didn't have the arms and legs to execute the strategy, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like me giving them this great bl blueprint and saying like, hey, follow up with me when you've done these things, but then they're drowning in all the other things they were already trying to juggle and it would never get done or only parts mm -hmm. of it would get done. It was just kind of not helpful for anybody. And mm -hmm. so I developed this thesis that was twofold. One was I missed having my own team. Mm -hmm. So that was just like, I wanted to have a team and people to smart people to bounce off of. And then two was if I built a full stack marketing org and roamed around the Valley with, with me at the helm of strategy, plus really talented arms and legs to execute that, that would be really, really helpful for a lot of these companies that I had previously just been halfway helpful for. Mm. And so, uh, that was kind of like the test. I, I assembled this amazing B2B marketing squad, um, full stack from, you know, demand gen to paid media, to design, to dev, to all the things that would like get in the way of uh, product marketing, all the things that would get in the way of like a marketing org being mm -hmm. successful and started doing these engagements, but with that model mm -hmm. and very, very quickly people were asking for more of it. Right. And mm -hmm. so it was just like, I didn't really go into it thinking I was going to build this bigger thing that it became, um, but it turns out there's just a tremendous appetite for, for it. And so I scaled it from there. Yeah, that's, that's wild. I mean, in that experience, while you're doing the e-commerce business and your, your contacts are referring you projects to plug in here and there and help people in a pretty dis, you know, discreet way. Um, what sort of, did you develop any sort of, do you start to see things in terms of like specific patterns? Like, okay, this falls into this kind of bucket here. Is it, like, I'm just curious, what sort of patterns did you start to see emerge in terms of challenges and strategies that would overcome them? Yeah. So the, my answer to this question is, is not a popular one because I think everybody, whether they're the CEO or CMO or like, um, maybe at this point, the CMO, CMO is no better, but uh, definitely like executives in general, investors, they're all looking for like, they all want there to be a silver bullet. They're, they all want there to be this like killer strategy that, you know, slingshots them ahead of the competition. And my honest answer is that that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. It and, and the only times that it does exist, it's more so catching the right market dynamics and wave Mm -hmm. And you just catch it at the right time. It's like literally thinking of it as surfing, you know, mm -hmm. you can, the wave is there. Some people catch it. Some people don't, and you can get pushed really like everything can go well or it cannot. Um, and so the, the patterns were even the most successful companies, even the drop boxes and the looms and like, like fill in the blank, shiny logo that we have, um, grain product board G2, like th they're a bunch it was almost always, the pattern was almost always helping them slow down to go faster, mm -hmm. right? Like, because if you think about the life cycle of these companies, they are going as fast as they can, as hard as they can, hacking at stuff, pushing, 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 pushing. And then at some point, some of them become start to become successful. And a lot of the time they've ignored a lot of the fundamentals to get to where they are, right? They've, they've, um, 
the foundation, they didn't take the time to build the foundation because they were just scrapping to try to make something work. And then it starts to work and they're like, well, shit, what's working. And they don't really know necessarily what's working because they don't have the foundation. So I think a lot of the, the work that becomes the most valuable is, is helping pull them back a little bit, take stock of what exists, of what they're doing well and what's missing, and then really re- like repair the holes mm-hmm. so that they have a solid foundation and then they can go much faster than they were in the first place. Um, you know, people talk a lot about demand capture and demand creation. Um, I think these are the kind of two most common ways when we're talking about modern marketing. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, you're either creating new demand or you're capturing existing demand and your programs can fit into these buckets. But something that I talk about is you that's, you know, you're that's kind of like mid-layer lens. You're mm-hmm. looking at the 10,000 foot lens there but you really need to pull back to the 30,000 foot lens, which is what I call demand efficiency, Mm -hmm. right? Which is how efficient are each of your programs behaving both as like individual entities. And then also how do they interplay with one another? And then that drives efficiency as well. And what are you missing right from the whole picture? And so, you know, when companies are trying to like companies come to matter made for two things, one, help them reduce cost to acquire. Two, once we've done that, help them scale with this new, better, you know, cost to acquire figure. And the way that we do that is zooming out, doing an audit and, and really ranking them against their peers on demand efficiency, where we've come up with a framework. We can actually give it a number and say, Hey, like in your industry, you scored a 71, at, whereas the top 10 in your space are up at like a 93 hmm. and we can see exactly where those gaps are. And usually it's in programs that are missing, things they haven't done, general velocity and habits, standard mm-hmm. operating procedures of teams. Like it's not just let's ship a campaign and optimize the shit out of it in a channel. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's also the soft tissue and the interconnective tissue and all the surfaces in the buyer journey that stitch marketing together as a whole. So um, I, I went a little bit into the weeds there for a second. And I can't awesome. even remember what we're talking about. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I guess... It comes back to, to, to patterns and kind of seeing these commonalities, like what's, what's missing, uh, what needs to be improved, what criteria, how did you come up with this defended demand efficiency metric? How did you come up with a way to actually quantify it? That's super interesting. Like what are the, without giving away your secret sauce, I'm just curious, like what, what are the, you know, what, what are the different areas that constitute demand efficiency? in your opinion. Yeah, for sure. I mean, demand efficiency crosses a lot of different surfaces, right? It's, um, there, there are about 40 questions that we ask in order to, to give the score and to benchmark. Um, those questions span total addressable market, top of funnel, mid funnel, bottom funnel, partnership between sales and marketing, messaging, positioning, um, retention and revenue orchestration. Right. And so it's really like, walking a full 360 around all of the different surfaces that um, customers can interact with your brand and move through your funnel. Um, and it was, it wasn't clear to me until we had done enough back to your question about patterns. Like this the idea of demand efficiency wasn't clear to me until we had done, you know, we were helping like 10 to 15 companies become unicorns every year, right? And now unicorns is a dirty word because for for a second there, like valuations got out of hand, but um, I think our logos speak for themselves. It's like, you know, we're helping these companies reach this level of success. And what I realized was it's, it's kind of like when you go and try to hire a really good marketing exec or growth exec, and and you're trying to communicate to recruiters, exec recruiters, like, okay, we're looking for someone who has, who's going to be able to come in and their gut, like they based on their past experience, we want this amazing track record because that will give them this gut where they can cut through the bullshit, tell us what to focus on, tell us not what to focus on, right? And that's really what Matter Made's value proposition was. was like, hey, if you don't have that person or if you have that person and they're focused on a specific thing, we can come in and augment. Um, and we were doing the same thing from our gut, like, okay, we've just seen these five or 10 different examples of success or what, you know, what, what worked, what didn't let's apply it here. But we'd never really written out, like, can we turn this into a framework? Can we mm-hmm. actually like quantify this and take marketing from what essentially is like a black box for a lot of people, except for the people who have that gut and have that experience again, air quotes on all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was like, no, of course we can. Like, let's just think through every single engagement we've ever done 
and write out all of the different areas that like led to revenue acceleration Mm -hmm. and led to the reduction of cost to acquire. Mm -hmm. And then let's stack rank these and figure out and then weight them and create a scoring model. And then boom, now you have something that someone can self-evaluate within 15, 20 minutes of answering questions and figure out how they're doing, figure out where their low hanging fruit is. And then not only that, but, but see that low hanging fruit in order of priority. So it's like <laughs> this incredibly value. I mean, this is something that we could have just kept as an internal tool for us yeah, for like scoping mm-hmm. and strategy. But instead I was like, this is way more powerful if, if we put it out into the market and give people the opportunity to, to use this. Um, they don't have to work with Mattermade. They can just use this as a resource. Wow. Yeah. Just defining the whole thing. That's, that's fantastic. And it's crazy too. I mean, it gets back to, uh, I think before the call, we were talking a little bit about, you know, how a lot of these companies are really skeptical about engaging with an agency, right? And where yeah. like the value that you provide is you have all these, all this other data you've seen, you know, the pattern recognition is off the charts versus someone who's been in one company for three years, five years, whatever. So you come into the table with that and then now being able to really um, like standardize and, and provide benchmarks and that then as, as a starting off point is, is amazing. So that's, that's super cool. I mean, how long did it take you to develop that? the demand efficiency scoring framework. I feel like it's one of those things where it's like the plumber story where the, you know, <laughs> yeah. the plumber comes in and the top of yeah. uh, <laughs> where it's like, it's taken me the last eight years of, of being in marketing at yeah. the exact level. And then it took me, you know, two weeks of really buckling down with my brain and like writing it out and turning it into a model. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, that that's awesome. That's super cool. I mean, um, I, can we talk about your, your account-based marketing strategy with all this, or is that like, is it I uh, I don't know if that's with, okay. So you have an amazing podcast. I'll say this. <laughs> so yeah, you. you have a really, a really good podcast. Like it's, it's, it's fascinating. And you know, um, you were, you're saying that you were going to incorporate this demand efficiency uh, sort of scoring potentially real time on podcasts with certain types of guests. I just wanted, wanted to see if, if, if you say anything more about that. Yeah, no, of course. I mean, I think every, I think at this point, most, most folks are clued into the idea that like podcasts are not only a tool for creating great content, but it's also a great way to build relationships with um, people who can be influential in your space. Again, like this kind of goes back to the very first strategy I rolled out when I was growing glider, same idea. So for me, you know, what is the best way for me to build the benchmarks of the most successful companies in certain industries? Well, shit, it's to have them on the podcast, talk about demand efficiency and fill out that, that thing live with them, which helps us, you know, we, we of course have already a database that we're building, you know, of our, of the, the scores from our clients and all these things, but uh, a way to accelerate that. And purposefully, like if we, for example, you know, we don't do much in biotech, but I would love to have like a benchmark for biotech. So I can invite a bunch of CMOs from biotech, um, like leading biotech companies and have them on the podcast and go through that uh, score with them. And then bam, I've got the top 10 you know, biotech companies in, in our, in our, um, in our index. So yeah, I mean, that's absolutely a big part of the strategy. And then, you know, inherently you're going to get people either invited on the podcast or who hear the podcast and then they go take the the self assessment and they and they're like, well, should I want to improve this? And then of course it becomes a great you know it's an account based strategy at that point. That's super cool. It's, it's interesting too. You know, we talked about our mutual colleague uh, Nathan Latka, and yeah. I mean he does like he goes. You know, I was wondering when we were, when we were talking about this, like, are people really going to be able? Are they really going to be willing to do this the demand efficiency? Uh, you know, self scoring publicly. And I thought, well, wait a second. Nathan has proof of concept. He's got these founders who are just giving away all their numbers on these podcasts. And he's created this whole, yeah. like, you know, literal, literal index of all this, which is wild. Um, so man, I, I'm super excited to hear this because uh, that's going to be super insightful. Um, yeah. I, I guess one thing I, I wanted to ask you too is, you know, would you say that what you've built at Mattermade and the experiences that you built are only really apply to these sort of, you know, series A and beyond companies, or is it something that a, you explore with companies in different situations? Um, 
yeah, I'm just curious about that. Yeah, I mean, I think at the, at its core, marketing and driving demand is is understanding human psychology, right? You're not. It's not really that industry specific. It's not really that. Um, you know, like I'll give you an example. The neighbor across the street from me, awesome lady named Barb. She has a personal training business, right? And we were talking about like, I think we we're going for a hike one day and I was asking her what her client capacity was looking like. And she's like, yeah, you know, I've got space for some more clients, blah, blah, And I was like, cool. Like, you know, I, 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 I would do this marketing thing, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like, let me see if I can drive some, some new business to you. And maybe one of the most gratifying things I did all year that year, which was like help her drive demand to her business and, and like get the re seeing the reaction of her getting email notifications and then coming to me and saying, Hey, can we turn this off? Like, uh, I can't, I can't take any more mm -hmm. inbound. Um, <laughs> and, and I've never been in that position before. So, um, you know, to get back to your question, like this is, this is universal stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Some of the details are industry are specific to, you know, series A, series B companies. Cause you know, you're not going to, a personal trainer is not going to be buying like intense software to, mm -hmm. you know, or, or, or like installing six cents, uh, to manage an account-based strategy. But, um, but I think the the underlying principles that really reduce costs and drive growth are all coming back to just understanding human behavior and tapping into that in an efficient way. Got it. Makes sense. I mean, how do you, with all these all-stars on your team, you know, you mentioned design, paid media, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How do you take a company in it and triage them to identify, you know, there's so many different areas you could explore. I'm just curious yeah. how, how that takes place and how you can actually decide, okay, this is our highest priority here. Here's what we're going to do. I'm just curious about that process. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I think at the end of the day, it comes down to what are the North Star metrics, right? Like, at any given point in time, they're going to know and be able to pinpoint here's what, here's what's going to get me fired or here's going to, what's going to get me promoted. Or like, if I'm the CEO, like, here's what the, is going to keep me in my seat versus the board's going to come to me and say, Hey, like you're going to resign now <laughs> kind of a thing. <laughs> um, and so it's understanding what is, what is that goal or what are those goals? And then just putting the best resources on the job. So you know, certain companies that come to us, if they're spending north of 200K a month in, in advertising across paid social search, et cetera, then most likely reducing costs to acquire and helping them scale that, that paid program is going to be the most helpful thing for them. And so we'll put them on our paid media team. Um, and we've driven, you know, like we work with Yelp and uh, a handful of other companies on the paid media side where we've just driven some pretty insane case studies. Um some other companies come to us and their earlier stage series a series b and they go we just don't even understand we need to understand what our whole program should look like and we're nowhere near spending that much in paid in which case we engage on like a holistic de demand gen strategy and execution full stack team level some companies come to us and say hey we you know we keep getting hung up because our designers can't ship us creative in time or design in time and we're just like not able to produce put things out in the wild and test things fast enough, in which case, like we send them over to our friends at no boring design and they get on like a 2,500 a month retainer and unblock themselves. Right. So it's just like, and, and, you know, same thing for other like SEO, we have partners and friends that we refer people to. So it's just about understanding where, where the biggest lift can be had and aligning with that. Got it. Makes sense. And how does it, how is it, what does, what's the journey been like in terms of as an agency owner pricing these different solutions and knowing how to, best position that yeah i mean th that's like a constantly changing um, constantly moving target right i mean i remember thinking that i was going to price in a certain way and then two years later our price was 15 times higher mm -hmm. right and then you know big market shift just happened so like we're not going to try to keep charging what we had been charging because companies are spending differently right so it's you have to be very much in lockstep with what's lockstep with what's happening in the market, um, and I think that's just always always an evolving thing. And then, I mean, along those lines too, you've I know you've had a just done an amazing job of building um, a team of 
insane design, just design talent. It's clear from everything that I've seen that you do. And I'm just curious, you know, are, are you exploring any sort of new ventures or anything in that space, in the design space? Yeah, totally. No, it's funny you brought that up. Um, what I, I had this realization, I kind of mentioned it a second ago, which was like across almost all of our clients, there was this challenge of design always like the in-house, if they had an in-house designer, that designer was spending 80% of their time on the product. And then whatever was left would kind of get scrapped up between marketing for campaigns and product marketing and sales enablement and brand. And usually like the timelines were always unpredictable. And, and so like, if you think that marketing velocity is a huge leading indicator for pipe, which it is, then not having creative in time is a huge blocker for pipeline priorities. And mm -hmm. so, you know, most people wouldn't think of design, at least inherently at the outset as something that's super strategically important, but it is when you kind of see how it affects other things. And so um, most of our clients were adding on these design retainers with us. And I, I kind of came around to this realization that our total addressable market for people who need to work with Mattermade is, you know, call it 10%, 20% of the you know, high growth tech market of people who can afford us and who have the you know, right team structure and timing and all that. But the number of people in that market and even outside of specifically the tech market, but just in general, high growth companies who need high quality design turned around really quickly and really reliably at a fixed predictable price point so that they can launch campaigns and build their brand and all these things. That's a much larger addressable market. Mm -hmm. And I had already built this insane team with creative director and designers and all this. Um, so yeah, actually I have been in the process of spinning them out into this new brand called no boring design. It's like mm -hmm. no boring design.com and offering it as a monthly subscription, super mm -hmm. low price point starts at 2,500 a month. And the idea there is, you know, people, all different types of businesses, not just the ones that matter made works with can have access to the same creative team that is working on Dropbox campaigns, Yelp campaigns, you know, all of the fastest like loom product or all these calm, like all of these big names that people hear about. I don't think that they should be the only ones to benefit from the level of talent and expertise that we've, we've been able to build. So yeah, that's, that's, amazing. Uh, that's the new side hustle. <laughs> that's super cool. I, I just got a, a couple more questions for you. Um, that's I mean, for, yeah, by the way, that's awesome. Spinning that out. That's going to be so huge. What an opportunity for people to get that kind of high level design eye on whatever it is that they're working with. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, I mean, to what, what is, is there, what's the challenge like when you, you're coming to these different companies and you're dealing with different levels of understanding their data? Like, what is that? Like the data onboarding process, is that a challenge? A lot of times we're just curious about that. Incredibly challenging. Yeah. You have to, I mean, in order to do what you do, you have to have, uh, your own team of marketing ops leaders, um, analytics leaders, like mm -hmm. you really can't you can't mess around on that front because everyone's going to have their own unique data challenges spread across multiple systems modeled in different ways and then there's the you know the change management piece of okay here's current status here's where it needs to be now we have to communicate with all the executives that hey like the way that you're used to doing this needs to change here's why here's the promised land here's what it's going to be and why it's beneficial and then the technical acumen to not only navigate the change change management but technically implement this across systems and then model it and visualize it and make it trustworthy. I think the biggest challenge that a lot of companies run into is they don't end up trusting their data mm -hmm. or their attribution. And like, how are you supposed to make intelligent business decisions if you don't trust your data? So um, yeah, that's, that's always a, a huge priority when we're building out our teams and figuring out how to allocate talent. That's awesome. That's super cool. Um, and then last thing is it's crazy that, so you moved to Denver and then you started basically uh, an agency servicing like sil the Silicon Valley elite. <laughs> so <laughs> super, ir super ironic how that seems to have worked out. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it was just a uh, factor of like, where, where was my network? Like yeah. who, who did I know and who trusted me and uh, my whole network from building glider was Silicon Valley. Yeah. So I feel really fortunate that I was able to 
remain plugged in and remain a trusted resource to that cohort. Yeah, it's a testament to what you bring to the you know every every game that you're in. So that's it's fantastic. Um, Eli, man, I've really been awesome to chat with you and just learn more about your journey. And there's been a lot of just a lot of tactical stuff you shared to you, strategic and tactical. Um, in addition, just being a really inspiring uh, story of how you've how you've developed and all these adventures. So I really, <laughs> really, really appreciate it. Uh, if if people want to learn more about what you do in Mattermade and, and, and No Boring Designs, um, where can they where can they find out more? Yeah, for sure. Um, Mattermade.co and NoBoringDesign.com are the sure. two two websites. I, I'm imagining there'll be like a link somewhere in the yeah. the episode stuff um and you can always reach out to me directly elias at mattermade.co awesome well thank you so much for for being on the chat appreciate it yeah ian this was super fun thanks for having me man awesome thanks eli sweet awesome man thank you great stuff we'll cut there and uh cool yeah yeah it was fantastic just hell yeah yeah fun. yeah i always love shooting the shit so this was uh this was a fun convo you got a you got a you got a great story, man. So I'm glad, you Thanks, to, to, glad we, we got to you know, chat about it and get to share it. So, yeah, awesome. totally, dude. Well, uh, let me know how I can be helpful in, in pumping it out there and the timeline and stuff. I'll, I'll definitely promote it on our end. Uh, it sounds like you've got a, a pretty sizable audience, so that's cool too. Yeah, I'm excited to just get feedback. So we never talked to anyone in your world really, so it should be fun. Okay. Yeah. Sweet. Awesome, man. Well, oh, thank yeah. you so thank you so much. Appreciate your time. And yeah, if there's anything you know that that I can help with or um, whatever, just feel free to reach out. And I'd definitely love to stay in touch. Yeah, likewise. Let's keep in touch. Awesome. Well, have a great rest of your day out there. All right, you too, man. Yeah, see, ya. see you. See you. Bye. All right. So, recording the intro now. Um, All right, welcome to today's episode of the VidTal podcast. Uh, this is Ian Naj, co-founder of VidTal. And today we have a very special guest, Mr. Eli Rubel, um, co-founder of, okay, scratch that, that was the one. All right, new intro. New intro, all right. Welcome to today's episode of the VidTal podcast. I have a very special guest today, Mr. Eli Rubel, founder of Mattermade, the premier B2B marketing agency in Silicon Valley. Eli and his team have scaled companies like, excuse me, I'm going to start over. All right, new intro. New intro starts now. Welcome to today's episode of the VidTal podcast. This is Ian Nanj, co-founder of VidTal. And today we have a very special guest, Mr. Eli Rubel. Eli is the founder and CEO of Mattermade.co, which is the premier B2B marketing agency in Silicon Valley. Eli and his team have scaled companies like Dropbox, Loom, Crane. It, the list goes on and on and on. Um, seriously impressive work that he's done. And today we're going to talk about all things uh, demand efficiency, the metric that he's coined and that he uses to quickly assess where any business is at in terms of creating demand and meeting that demand when it comes to marketing and customer acquisition. And uh, in just a moment, we're going to get into that podcast, also go through Eli's very interesting story and how he got to the position he's in now. Uh, in the meantime, right now, also, we just want to make sure that you're aware that VidTal Premium is available at a very special rate. Uh, go to VidTal.com, log into your account. Inside the app, you should see a link to claim a special savings on VidTal Premium. Get all of the training on YouTube ad media buying, on creatives, on tracking, et cetera, et cetera. It's all in there for you as a VidTal Premium member. Go ahead and check it out. And it's going it, to, the price is going to be changing soon. So I just want to make sure you take advantage while the opportunity still is there. In, all right. So ready to start the podcast. All right. So here's the, the outro. 
All right, great podcast today with with Eli. We went over demand efficiency and his tactics and strategies for scaling these Series A B two B companies and how it applies to pretty much any company in looking to scale and uh, acquire more customers for less marketing spend. No. <clears throat> New outro. New outro is this one. All right. All right. Thanks for checking out our podcast today with Eli of Mattermade. Go ahead and go to the uh, show notes or description to see Eli's agency, mattermade.co, and also his design team, which is noboringdesign.com. And also just as a reminder, VidTop Premium is, is available at a very special rate right now for current subscribers. So go ahead and log into your VidTal app at dashboard.vidtal.com and you can log in and claim your special discount on Vidtal Premium. Get all access to the tools, full unlimited access to the YouTube ads library and all the training we're doing from our team at Incepli on YouTube ad media buying, creative building, tracking, et cetera, et cetera. Really can't wait to share this training with you. It's what, what's allowed us to uh, drive over $150 million of YouTube traffic for clients across the board. Go ahead and check it out inside the top. Thanks so much for attending this episode and looking forward to the next one. This is Ian Naj, co-founder of VidTao, signing off. And by the way, if you ever would like to brainstorm on how to scale your company with video ads, specifically YouTube, feel free to sub set up a brainstorm chat at uh, inceptly.com slash call. We'll get on a call, walk through your challenges, identify some solutions and present some options for helping you scale whether internally or with outside partners, inseparably.com slash call, free brainstorm, YouTube video advertising. Thanks so much. Have a great rest of your day. All right. Well, thank you for joining us for this episode of VidTal Podcast. Again, my name is Ian Naj, co-founder of VidTal, and really appreciate you having a listen. And it means a lot. So if you have any feedback, Go ahead and email us at info at vidtow.com. Love to hear your ideas for future shows, future guests. If you want to be a guest, let us know. Love to chat. Also, just as a reminder, this show has been sponsored by Vidtow, which is our free YouTube ad library, vidtow.com. Again, you can go to Vidtow and look up over a million ads at this point inside of Vidtow. And uh, they're all unlisted YouTube ads. You can see what your competitors are running, track the results on a day-by-day -day basis, find new ads inside of our YouTube ad library, VidTal. And we also have a premium edition of VidTal. So the library is free to access, but for full unlimited access to the library, we have a premium, ed a premium edition of VidTal. And we also have training from our Inceptly.com agency, which is our sister company to VidTal, where we've managed over $150 million on YouTube. We provide training on media buying, creatives, tracking, uh, copywriting, everything in between. It's all there inside of VidTal Premium. And right now we're running a very special deal on VidTal Premium. And you can go claim that right now at VidTal.com. When you sign up for free, you'll see the offer to join Premium and go there and check that out. And last thing, we also do uh, free brainstorm calls with our agency, Inceptly. Go to inceptly.com slash call. And we love brainstorming with you on your video advertising um, and just marketing in general. Love to chat. So inceptly.com slash call, C-A-L-L. -L. Would love to speak with you. So thanks again for joining us and looking forward to the next show. In the meantime, have a great week.